I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, as we continue this teaching series titled Short Stories. In Matthew chapter 13, we find several different parables, short stories that Jesus would would share uh, with the disciples and all who would hear, have ears to hear on this day. We're going to begin in verse 24 as Nate and Hannah uh, led us in the reading of uh, the word of God. Pastor Rowley kicked off this teaching series with a powerful word last week. Amen. amen. And, uh, and so we're going to continue with part two. The main idea is that there are weeds among the wheat. There are weeds among the wheat. Once again, let's, let's look to uh, the word of God. Verse 24. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven. The point of the parables was the kingdom of heaven. It was all about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of heaven. He was instructing his disciples in the way of the kingdom of heaven. He was pointing people to the kingdom of heaven. It was a message of repentance to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we see The second parable in Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while people were sleeping, other translations will read, while the servants were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat and left. When the plant sprouted and produced again, the grain, the weeds also appeared. The landowners came to him and said, master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and pull them up? The servants asked him. No, he said. When you pull up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them but collect the wheat in my barn. Then beginning in verse 31, Jesus shares another parable, another short story. He explains the parable fulfilling prophecy in verse 34. And then look to verse 36. Verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went to the house. His disciples approached him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Uh, So evidently, the disciples didn't have a clue what Jesus was really getting after as he shares this short story. He needed, uh, they needed explanation that day. And so he replies, verse 37, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed. These are the children of the kingdom, the weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Therefore, verse 40, therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin, and those guilty of lawlessness, they will burn, they will throw them into blazing, a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. I don't know if the disciples knew what they were really asking for, for Jesus to explain the parable, but Jesus nevertheless explains the parable. And and, and if you're like me, as as I read the the Bible, I I love a printed copy. I, I love the you version Bible app on the go, but I, I really love to study in a printed Bible because uh, scriptures just just pop off the page, it's just different thoughts, and I'm able to underline and kind of like focus in a little better. And, and so Jesus explains, and so if you are like me and you underline, you'll you'll see the explanation of the parable. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. One who sows good seed equals Jesus. The field is the world. The field equals the world. Uh, The good seed 
is the children of Jesus' kingdom. The good seed is the children of Jesus' kingdom. The, the weeds... The weeds are the children of the evil one. The enemy is Satan. The harvest is the end of the age or the time of this church age closes. It's the second coming of Jesus. The harvesters are angels. And so we, we see that Jesus' explanation. Now look back to verse 37. Jesus explains that the farmer, the, the master... The one who is sowing good seed. There's only one. And it's the son of man. There's only one. And his name is Jesus. It's not you. And it's not me. It's him. In him alone. There's only one who is the Lord of Lords. And the King of Kings. There's only one who holds all authority. And his name is Jesus. And so let's be clear from the beginning of all of this, from the outset of this entire story. It's all about one person. And I wonder, who or what are you living for today? Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. This isn't the first time we've seen this reference. But what is the meaning, the significance of this reference? It's it's really good for you and I to understand the significance of this reference. Because it's a reference of humility. That God Almighty would look upon a sinful man and would be willing to leave the throne room of heaven and put on flesh and dwell among us. And that Jesus would really walk this this world for three years and would go to the cross, a Roman cross, and would be crucified on that Roman cross, and his blood would shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and our Savior Jesus would be placed in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, on the third day, he would rise victorious from that borrowed tomb, and because Jesus is alive. You and I had the opportunity to be alive. Because Jesus conquered the grave and death, you and I can be forgiven of all of our sins and have a hope of heaven one day. And so, the one sowing good seed is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. And may it always continue to be about Jesus. May the church, you and I, those who are in Christ Jesus, May this life that we live because of God's grace, because in him we move, live, and exist and have our being, may we live for his glory and his glory alone, period. There's one master farmer, and his name is Jesus. Look to verse 38. The field equals the world. Do you see that? The field, as Jesus explained, the field equals the world. And as long as... God's people are still in this world, the field. There will be unbelievers among them. There are weeds among the wheat. There are weeds among the wheat. The field. The world that we live in is a dark, broken, sinful place. But there's hope. There's hope in the person of Jesus. The one sowing good seed. And there's hope even in the good seed. As Jesus lives within us, as we shine his light, and as we are his love to a lost, broken, dark, sinful world, that the weeds might see what the wheat has to offer. So why are there weeds among the wheat? If you're a note taker, I encourage you to take notes. If you're a note taker, would you write this down? This is the broken world that we are living in. Why are there weeds among the wheat, you might ask, because this is the broken world that we are living in. Although we live in this world, church, we are called to not be of this world. We're called to a different standard. We're, we're, we're called to a different uh, conduct. We're called to different actions. We're called to different speech. That a lost world, the weeds might see Jesus alive in us, the wheat. That's why Jesus teaches to not be unequally yoked. 
It's important to heed the words of Jesus. Live by the words of Jesus. Why? Why should you not be unequally yoked? Because how can the two grow in Christ Jesus together? How can Jesus be the number one priority of the home if both aren't in Christ Jesus? It just can't happen. And so Jesus heeds the church to not be unequally yoked. We're, we're called as the church to not be conformed to this world, to not allow culture to dictate the standard by which we live our lives. Don't be conformed to this world. We're called to be holy as he is holy, 1 Peter tells us to. To be holy, to be, to be set apart. We're to grow in holiness each day that the Lord allows us to see. To take one step of faith. To take one step of growth in knowing him and living for him. We see in verse 38, the good seed, again, equals God's children. The good seed equals God's children. Now, not all humanity are God's children. I don't know where this teaching has come from. Uh, it's, it's certainly not from the, the Bible. We're all created in the image of God, but we're not all God's children. Why do I say that? I say that dogmatically and emphatically because uh, based on the authority of the word of God, we are only God's children, the good seed, once we are adopted into the family of faith. We become sons and daughters of his king, uh, kingdom. Of the king. And so Jesus teaches plainly, clearly in this parable, there's two different kinds of peoples. You got the weed and you got the weeds. You got God's children and you got Satan's children. And some of y'all are like, wow, that's kind of harsh. Well, Jesus, you know, didn't mix his words. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and we shouldn't either. We should be clear in our position based upon what the word of God declares to be true. Amen. The weeds... Satan's children, also known as a false wheat. It's interesting that this parable, this, this short story before us is not just teaching us about the gospel's enemy. It's also showing us one of his favorite tactics. When the farmer sows the good seed, the enemy does not try to dig it up. Don't miss this. The enemy doesn't try to dig it up. He doesn't try to burn the field. He doesn't try to poison the, field, the, the, the wheat or steal the wheat. Instead, what does he do? He plants weeds among the wheat. It's one of his tactics. It's one of his schemes. He plants weeds among the wheat. And these weeds are counterfeits. They, uh, they, they're trying to imitate. I once heard lust imitates love. Pride imitates joy. Drugs imitate peace. Sin imitates freedom. Satan imitates God. And don't be deceived by counterfeits. Amen. Oh, we better be wise. Just because somebody wears that cross around their neck doesn't mean they belong to Jesus. Just somebody uh, was raised in a Christian home doesn't mean they belong to Jesus. Just somebody has the biggest Bible, you know, that five-pound Bible that, that used to be around coffee tables doesn't mean they belong to Jesus. Just because someone shows up to church Sunday after Sunday doesn't mean they belong to Jesus. It's only based on our, our confession that he's Lord. And I'm a sinner, a wretched sinner. Unworthy. And so why do, why would you let weeds grow with wheat? Weeds look like wheat. These weeds were called tares in biblical times. They're called darnel in Today's time, sometimes even called false wheat, this false wheat looks just like the real wheat until, until it bears seed. But by then the roots of this wheat have surrounded the roots of the wheat in order to suck up all, all the nutrients. And because its roots are so intertwined, they're so intertwined with the roots of the wheat, pulling this weed would also uproot the wheat. Pulling this weed would also uproot the wheat. And so the weeds that the and it came at night while the servants were sleeping. Planted these weeds among the wheat. Planted them to look like the real thing even though they weren't the real thing. And Jesus explains that they're not the real thing. They're not my children. They're Satan's children. And in the broken world that we're living in, there's all kind of counterfeits. Maybe even some today 
There, there might be some weeds even in the seats today. Your confession doesn't match your commitment. Your, your heart doesn't match your habits. Your belief doesn't match your behavior. And so we see the good seed that is God's children. We see the, the weeds that are Satan's children. And, and then in verse 39, we see an enemy. We see an enemy. The enemy is Satan. The devil. Secondly, why are there weeds among the wheat? Would you write this down? There is an enemy. There is an enemy that we encounter. There is an enemy that we encounter. C.S. Lewis wrote this years ago. Beware not to fall into either of two common traps. Either refusing to believe that the enemy exists or spending too much time thinking and worrying about this enemy. He said, beware. Heed the warning. Heed the warning. Refusing to believe that the enemy exists or spending too much time thinking or worrying about the enemy. I wonder where you find yourself today. There's a real enemy. His name is Satan. God has sown good seed. Good seed. And there are weeds among the wheat. And as God sows seeds of of faith, hope, love, kindness, forgiveness, patience, justice in our world. Our enemy, what is he doing? He is sowing seeds of discontent. He's sowing seeds of fear. He's sowing seeds of anger and hatred and division and frustration and despair. He wants you to live absolutely hopeless, but there is hope in Jesus. And so we have an enemy and his name is Satan. We have a real enemy Understand this today clearly. We have a real enemy. His name is Satan. Jesus reminds us in this parable, this short story, that Satan is very real and is very busy trying to undo what Jesus and his followers are doing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, would you write this reference down? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded, be alert, be sober-minded, be alert. Don't go to sleep. Don't be drunk. Don't get caught off guard. He said, your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. He's looking, he's looking, he's waiting, he's watching, he's, he's waiting and watching for you to enter that most vulnerable state. You know that vulnerable state when, when temptation is so real, it's so real before you, and it, it, it's so tempting, the thing before you is so tempting. He's, he's looking for that most vulnerable state. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that's why we must not go to sleep church. That's why we must be strengthened by the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6. Would you write that reference down? Ephesians 6 verse 10 says this. Finally be strengthened by the Lord. By who? The Lord. By his vast strength. Don't, don't try to, don't try to put, put your own strength together. Don't try to gather it all here. It won't be enough. It won't last. Be strengthened Paul says to the church in Ephesus. Be strengthened by his strength. By his strength. Verse 11. Then he says this. Put on the full armor of God. Not just what you think you need, right? Don't just run out to the war naked. <laughs> how many times, how many, how many days go by that you just get up and you go? You get up and you go. I mean, hopefully you put some clothes on, you know. Uh, but spiritually speaking, how, how many times do we just get up and go? We, we run out there naked. Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can, why? Stand against the schemes, those tactics, those evil plans of the devil. Put on the full, the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12, listen to this closely. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Oh, the enemy would love for us to focus on one another. That person that hurt me, that person that said that, the person that cut me off, that person that did this, the person that said this and never showed up, or, you know, unkept promises, all of this. Some of y'all even holding on to some bitterness today that you need to release. You've given the enemy a, 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 some room and you need to release it to the Lord and move, move on past that hurt, past that broken promise. And you need to trust the Lord, uh, your God, my God, that will never fail you. So for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but who's the struggle against? We know, we know, you know this. It's against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Who are we at war with? The enemy, Satan and his demons. Yet the evil that is throughout this world, the evil is a result of a real enemy. How many of you know that to be true? The evil is a result of a real enemy. When we look out, we see evil. We see evil all around us. You, you pulled the news on whatever channel, whatever phone, whatever, whatever platform. It's evil. I mean, you step outside your front door and you hit in the face with evil. I mean, you, you, you turn that show on and boom, evil. <laughs> you don't have to go far to find evil. It's all around. And the evil is the result of a real enemy. The devil is real. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. The devil will use whatever he can, whenever he can, and whoever he can to destroy the works of God. Don't miss this. Whatever he can, whenever he can, whoever he can. Why? To destroy the works of God. Uh, remember this, church. Remember that Satan's cause is lost. The war is over. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus willingly went to the cross to defeat sin and Satan once for all. Look to verse 39. Look to verse 39. Jesus refers to the harvest. He explains the harvest. The harvest at the end of the age. The harvest is the, the second coming of Jesus. That, that, that is our, our hope. Our hope is that he's coming back. As he shares this second parable, he had come the first time. And he was born, and he was born as in that manger, and so cuddly, you know, the sweet story. At least in our minds, it's sweet, but anyone that's ever had a baby <laughs> knows that there ain't no way that baby. Lord Jesus was just quietly sleeping in that manger. At, at some point, he had to make some noise. <laughs> but he came the first time. That's how he came the first time. But the hope that we have as believers in Christ Jesus on the authority of Scripture is that he's coming again. The second coming of Jesus to collect his bride. And the question is, will you be ready? Will you be ready when he returns in, in the clouds? Will you be ready? No one knows when he's coming. There, there's, there's, there's false prophets that have set dates. And of course, they've been proven wrong. Don't listen to that nonsense. Don't get caught up in that nonsense. Jesus said himself, no one, no, no one knows the day nor the hour. And that's why all of these letters to the New Testament churches is a call to be alert, to be ready, to stand firm, to be active, to be engaged in this really, real spiritual warfare. Harvest, the second coming. Uh, thirdly, why, why are there weeds among the wheat? Glad you asked. Why are there weeds? Why are there weeds among the wheat? Because there is a great harvest ahead. The enemy is trying to do everything he can to destroy the works of God as we've already seen. He's trying to do everything he can to destroy the works of God, planting all these weeds uh, you know, in, in, in the field full of wheat to destroy the works of God. And so why are there weeds among the wheat? Because there is a great harvest ahead. You, you think the enemy wants you living for the Lord? You think the enemy wants you experiencing the joy of the Lord? You, you think the enemy wants you to know what the love of God? Do you think the enemy wants you to fulfill a purpose? No, he wants you to sit in a dark, cold Room alone, not fulfilling the call in your life. That's exactly what the enemy wants. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Would you write that reference down? Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant or, or plentiful, right? The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, verse 38, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Pray to the Lord. The harvest is, is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. How will you live this life? It's, it's, a, it's a good question to consider. Maybe even better is, how are you living this life? Uh, let, me, let me encourage you today that God is still in control. As we look out in the evil all around us, as we look to the world around us, I, I want you to be encouraged today to not buy into the lies of the enemy today. Hear this truth. God is still in control. Jesus is still king. The Spirit of God still lives within you, the believer. The church is still essential. Satan is still deceiving. The gospel is still saving. But glory is still coming. Glory is still coming. There is a great harvest ahead. Why are there weeds? Why are there weeds among the wheat? Because there is a great harvest ahead. We see in Verse 39, harvesters are the angels. Jesus explains this. The harvesters are the angels. Now, let me explain something. Just to, let me clear something. If, if you have this thought or you've said this, take it back. Uh, this thought of once your life ends here, you become an angel up there. Can I just tell you, stop the nonsense. That, that's, that's, that's not the gospel. We don't find, show me the Bible, show me, show me, all right, show me. But, but that, 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 I understand why, I understand why, why we say things like that, that God has gained another angel. But that's not the Bible. I understand there's great comfort, but can I just tell you the, the greater comfort is this, that when our life is over here, we meet the Savior face to face. We meet him face to face where we'll spend all eternity worshiping and resting in his presence. I can't think of a greater comfort than that. I don't need to be promoted to an angel status, right? I, I, I'm a glorified body at that point, and I'm surrounded by the presence of God Almighty. Yeah. And so Jesus, Jesus explains this. He says the harvesters, notice he doesn't say to the disciples, hey, it's you. <laughs> You're the harvester. No. Nah. He doesn't, he doesn't say the good seed is the harvester, harvesters. He, he said the harvesters are the angels. And so Jesus makes this clear. Even, even in this small portion of the Bible, Jesus makes this very, very clear. But who are the servants, you might ask? Who are the servants? Back in verse 25, who, who are those servants? Uh, perhaps they are the disciples that have asked him, after he shared the story and they're alone with him. Hey, can you explain what, what you just shared? Because I had no clue what you just said. <laughs> can you explain that? And so Jesus explains it. Perhaps they're the disciples. But what we do know is that the disciples aren't the harvesters. The angels are the harvesters. And if that is true, that, that the servants in verse 25 are the disciples, and could I submit to you that the servant isn't qualified to judge the difference, the righteous and the wicked. It's the angels that God has selected to harvest the wheat, put them in the barn, put that wheat in the barn and, and the harvest the, the weeds and throw it on the fire. M may I just submit to you that the, the servant, you and I, aren't qualified to, to judge the difference between the righteous and the, and the wicked? And how, many, how many hours upon hours do we waste judging people based on their looks or ba based on their, uh, uh, their past? Past decisions? Can, can I encourage the church today? What we need to be doing is practicing the patience of God. What we need to be doing as the church today is to continue to grow in the faith, to, to grow in spiritual maturity. Can I encourage the church today that we need to stay rooted in, in God's love and we need to stand firm against the evil one. That's what we need to be doing today. Not so worried about uh, pointing out all these people's flaws because it's a lot easier to do that, by the way. It's a lot easier. It's a, lot, a whole lot easier to, to be the, the, the critic. Right? It's easy to do that. 
right? Because it takes the pressure off of you pointing out all these flaws. Can I just remind all of us today that there is a real battle against the spirit and the flesh. And each day is an opportunity to grow in the grace of God, to know him better and to make him known. Can, can we stay focused on that priority? Be a true witness for the Lord Jesus. For the rest of this uh, eat, this, uh, this, this age, uh, evil will always mingle with the good. So that as Jesus' followers, we must arm ourselves. We need to arm ourselves with patience in the face of situations that the enemy intends to bring about to disturb and distract us. This is what Jesus said. The master, as he's sharing the story, don't pull them up. Let both grow together. Everything will be sorted out at the harvest so that the weeds will be burned and the wheat will be gathered. Listen, we can't fix uh, all the problems of this world. The, the, this story tells us that. We can't always tell the difference between good and, and evil. This story tells us, tells us that. But in the midst of this very complicated, sinful, dark world, again, what we should be doing is, is growing in God's grace. What we should be doing is planting seeds of faith. We should be spend more time planting wheat than pulling up weeds. We should spend more time planting kindness and, and, and mercy and forgiveness and love rather than trying to pull up hatred and envy and, and frustration and, and, and anger. Look to verse 40. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus explains this story and, and the first part is really nice, right? It's, 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 it's encouraging. It's nice. But then, uh, but then, he, then he drops the bomb right here. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no cutting it, right? I, am a, I have a growing concern that the church today is trying to promote and preach a soft gospel. And we've stopped talking about sin and hell because if we're honest, we are more concerned about filling rooms and buildings than filling lives with the gospel of Jesus that transforms. That's not a judgment on any one particular church. That's just a growing concern of mine. And, and there's a call for me as a preacher of God to continue to preach the word in all of it. Amen. Not just the good soft stuff, but even this latter part. James Kaufman says regarding verse 40, 41 and 42, the ultimate fate of the wicked is a doom so intolerable and overwhelming that Christ came down from heaven and endured the pangs of suffering and death to deliver men from such a fate only a fool could set aside such warnings, delivered at such cost, and authenticated in every conceivable manner. What's he saying? I pray that those who are in Christ Jesus will never forget what it was to be apart from Christ Jesus. I pray that that we will remind ourselves daily that we were one step away from hell. That hell is a real place. We're, we talk about heaven and we're good with heaven, but we can't forget about hell. And there's a call in our lives as the church to preach the gospel as wheat. To go to the weeds and say, no, you don't want to stay dead. You don't want to say some false wheat. You want to come alive in Christ Jesus. And so here's the gospel. Here's the good news. This is what the Lord has done for you. Some of y'all saying, well, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Trust the Lord that he'll give you the words to say. Some of you say, I'm too scared. Trust the Lord that he's going to give you the courage to be a, a bold witness for him. 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says this, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I, I want this to just, just for a moment, allow this to sink, sink in deep. The reality of hell. I want just for a moment, Maybe there's some even in the house or online that have not surrendered their life over to Jesus. And so if you were to die today, you don't know where you would go. And if you haven't surrendered your life, can I just tell you where you would go? It's hell. And I'm not saying that like excited. That concerns me. I don't want anyone to spend eternity in hell. But that's what the truth of the Word of God says. I wonder as as we're sitting in this place today, comfortable seats for the most part, comfortable AC, but we're sitting in our comfort today. Would you just consider that one person, that one person in your life, that one family member that has rejected the gospel, that one coworker that has rejected the gospel, that, that one neighbor that has rejected the gospel, and would you just ask God to burden your heart for them? And maybe you spend more time rejoicing. And what a wicked response that would even be. But ask God to burden your heart for those that are apart from him that don't know him. Those whose names are not written in the book of life. That when they die, they will spend an eternity in hell. Verse 43 says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. Those who have confessed Jesus as Lord, trusted in his grace, in his salvation, he's master of your life. You've received the gift of salvation. Heaven awaits you. What a wonderful day it's going to be. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. All the evil that surrounded this earth, all the, all the moments of loss, all the tears that have been cried, it will will no longer be in heaven. What a day. What a day it's going to be. Quickly, the, the final, the final point of, final answer, I would say, to why are there weeds among the wheat? Going back to verse 25. I believe it's because the servants were asleep. The servants were asleep. They're sleeping, allowed the enemy to come in. I was riding around with my brother Ryan a few weeks ago, and he was showing me this hay field, and they just planted some seeds, and they got a hog problem. And, and, uh, and those hogs like to come in at night, right? And they like to tear it up. And, and it's really no different than this story right here. There's an enemy, a real enemy that's coming in. And, and here's, the, here's the tragedy, church. The enemy has crept in while we've been asleep. For far too long, the church has been silent. Man, we've gone soft. We, we've been silent. And the enemy, what has he done? He's just, he's just crept in. And he's planted, he's planted those seeds, those weeds. He's planted those weeds. And Revelation chapter 3, would you write that reference down? Verse 1, Revelation 3, verse 1 says, Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the Lord, uh, thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Verse 2, be alert, be alert, and strengthen what remains. Be alert. Don't go to sleep. 
Strengthen what remains which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Verse 3, remember then what you have received and heard. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. Repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. Why are there weeds among the wheat? The servants were asleep. The servants were asleep. Listen, an unguarded field is an easy target for the enemy. An unguarded marriage is an easy target for the enemy. An unguarded heart, an unguarded mind is an easy target for the enemy. And an unguarded church is an easy target for the enemy. Jude 1.4 says this, for certain people, Jude 1.4, for certain people have crept in, crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Certain people have crept in unaware. When, when, we, when we don't speak up, when we don't stand up against evil, we make it easy for evil to creep in. And so the church can no longer be silent can no longer just sit back in comfort. No, we need to press on with the gospel message. We, we can't allow, we can't tolerate uh, forms of evil to creep into the church and tell us what we should and should not be about. We have to stand firm in the faith, rooted in God's word. We can no longer be silent. We can no longer be silent. We, uh, we're allowing all forms of evil to creep in. All forms of evil to creep into the church with false doctrines. And so what are we doing? Nationally, primarily nationally, we're watering down our messages. We're watering down our messages because we gotta keep up with the culture. We gotta keep up with the culture. No, culture must not dictate the standard to which we conduct ourselves. It, it, it must be Christ and Christ alone. It must be Christ alone. In Christ alone, we need to come back to the basics, come back to the foundational truths, hold firm to the good doctrines of, of, of the Word of God. Hold firm. And don't relent. Don't give up. How are we going to hold firm? By first knowing. How do we know? By spending time in this Word, reading, praying, meditating, asking God to help us understand, explain. As those disciples asked Jesus, would you explain it to me? God, would you explain it to me? Don't, well, don't just wait till Sunday for the pastor to stand up here and explain this word, but daily get in this word. Dig in it. God, help me to understand this word and hold fast to the good doctrines. We're allowing all forms of evil to creep in to the church. There's all kinds of sparkle creeds now uh, in different churches. There's all kinds of shows and productions. There's all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of homosexuals and transgenders standing behind pulpits like this, trying to put uh, 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 some kind of a gospel message. And, and for far too long, the church has been silent. We got to come back to the word of God, stand on the authority of the word of God and proclaim and preach the word of God and hold on for dear life to the word of God. In November, I'll say it now, I'll probably say it again, <laughs> but every election year, we, we always just say this simply, you need to do due diligence and you need to vote based on your convictions, your biblical convictions, let me clarify. <laughs> Hopefully your convictions are your bibl are the biblical convictions, but okay. And, and so I would encourage you to start praying that way, whatever it looks like. And, and, and by the way, I'm not just talking about for the president, okay? If you're like, oh, yeah. no. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. What do you... But there is one that's really pressing on, on my heart. And one, one that Florida Baptist churches in particular are standing up and speaking out against. And, and it, it's Amendment 4. I don't know if you've seen Amendment 4, if you've heard about Amendment 4, but this is one that I would clearly tell you as the church to vote no. And if anybody's got any problem, well... I guess you'll see me in the parking lot after this. And so, that's cool. We, we can take it there. We can, we can take it in the parking lot. But uh, just, 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 just for clarity, though, 
Uh, Amendment 4 is deceptive. It eliminates parental consent. It gives broad authority to approve abortions. It allows for late-term abortions. And we're a church that stands on the sanctity of life. We believe that God is the giver of life. We praise him for every life that he gives and, and even the ones he takes away. But God is the giver of life. John Wesley said what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. And for far too long, the church has been silent, has been comfortable, and we've tolerated a whole lot of mess and a whole lot of culture to dictate our beliefs. And I say no more. No more tolerating, hold, and embrace the truth of the Word of God. I want to close. Uh, last week, my family and I were able to take a, take a few days away and I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% on my voice back, which is uh, frustrating. It's been like two weeks I've been struggling with this voice thing, and so I thought last week would be a good week to just unplug, and I'd, I'd be back 100%. Yesterday, I realized I wasn't going to be 100%, so it's like, okay, here we go, Lord. He's my strength. But uh, we were away last week, and we're in this restaurant. And I saw this poster on the wall. My ladies had used the restroom. They were in the restroom. So I started reading this poster. You got it up there? <laughs> this poster that you see on the screens is, it, it's a recruiting poster that was produced in the West Indies in 1915, 1915. Thousands of men and women across the British Empire volunteered to fight during World War I. The Caribbean was no different and men from across the region served in the Army and the Royal Navy. And this is what it says if you can't see it. It says, young men of the Bahamas, the British Empire is engaged in a life and death struggle. Never in the history of England, never since the misty uh, distant past of 2,000 years ago has our beloved country been engaged in such a conflict as she is engaged in today. To bring to nothing this mighty attack by an unscrupulous and well-prepared foe, his most gracious majesty, King George, has called on the men of his empire, men of every class, creed, and color, to come forward to fight that the empire may be saved and the foe may be well beaten. This call is to you, young man, not your neighbor, not your brother, not your cousin, but just you. Several hundreds of your mates have come up, have been medically examined and have passed as fit. What is the matter with you? Put yourself right with your king. Put yourself right with your fellow men. Put yourself right with yourself and your conscience. Enlist today. As I read that, oh, this... This message of weeds among the weeds started stirring within me. This message of uh, the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in started to stir within me. This call to enlist the church to step up to this good fight of faith started to stir within me. And so I just wonder today, as we close, who will rise up and enlist today? Who will commit to fighting the good fight of faith today? Who will speak up and stand up against evil today? Young men and women of the church. The kingdom of heaven is engaged in a life and death struggle. Never in the history of the church, never since the misty distant past of 2,000 years ago when she was established as our beloved church been engaged in such a conflict as she is engaged today to bring to nothing this mighty attack by an unscrupulous and well prepared foe who's the enemy is Satan his most gracious majesty King Jesus has called all the men of his empire, his kingdom. Men of every class, men of every creed, men of every color to come forward to fight that the kingdom of heaven may be saved and the foe, the devil, the evil one may be well beaten. This call is to you, young man, young woman, not your neighbor, not your brother, not your cousin, but just you. Several hundreds of your fellow believers have already come up and have 
been examined and their names are in the book of life. What is the matter with you? Put yourself right with your king. Put yourself right with your fellow men. Put yourself right with yourself and your conscience and enlist in this fight today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place, those that are online? Hey, I know we've gone over, but uh, the tailgates will still be there. Just for a moment, though, I wonder. I wonder if there's, uh, if there's one here today. You would say, Tim, I'm a follower of Jesus, but but I've been on the sidelines. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I've been sitting in comfort. I'm a follower of Jesus. I, I've been witnessing as a spectator the, the fight that's going on, but I haven't been engaged in it. But today, I'm, I'm enlisting. Today, I'm stepping forward, repenting of whatever is holding me back and trusting the Lord for the future. If that's your heart's desire, with nobody looking around, I want to pray for you and would you just have the courage just to stand to your feet? If that's you, I'm enlisting in the battle today. I'm enlisting in this good fight of faith today. I've been quiet for far too long. I've sat back, watched others. Would that be anyone's heart and desire today? Man, I see this, this one here. Anyone else you would say, I'm stepping forward, stepping in faith, trusting God to be used by him. Anybody else? Be your heart's desire today, amen. Amen. Amen, anyone else? I wanna pray for you in just a moment, I wanna pray for you. Anyone else? Amen. Anyone else's heart's desire to enlist, engage in this real battle? So those that are standing, would you, would you pray right where you're at? Ask the Lord for his strength. Ask the Lord for his courage. Ask the Lord for his wisdom. I wonder if there's one here today that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. If you were to die right now, you don't know where you would spend eternity, but there's hope in Christ Jesus. He's made a way. He's made a way. If there's one here today that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus, today, today be the day. Confess him as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And by faith, you will be saved. If that's your prayer, would you, from your heart to his, God, I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. I trust you completely for salvation. I believe in you completely. I'll follow you all the days of my life. Amen. In a moment after we, we close this out, there's going to be some men and women at our next step area. If there's some here today that you've come with some burdens and you'd like someone to pray with you, we would love to pray with you, men with men, women with women. If there's some questions, you've come with some questions today, we would love to take a moment and help answer those questions according to the scriptures. If you're wondering today, what is your next step in the faith journey? We would love to help you Walk through your next steps in the faith journey as best as we can. Whatever your decision is today, I want to encourage you. Stop by our next step area when all of this is said and done. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you, praise you. Thank you for those that stood all across this room. Lord, you know their hearts, you know their homes, you know their desire to live for you, to honor you. Lord, I pray that you would make them bold and courageous bold and courageous as we fight this real battle, this real enemy. So to you, be all the glory and all the honor. We praise you. We trust you. We live for you and you alone. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.